and good morning good afternoon good evening good middle of the night depending on where you are um so it's paul here um this is a very different session to what we've done before um so today's session for those of you that don't know um, this might be a bit of a surprise for those of you that do know this is a recap um so we are showing you some special stuff from capture one and phase one uh, in conjunction with teamwork so for those people that are joining in from teamwork welcome um to those people that are normally on here for editing sessions um, you're going to see some very very different things today um, to what we normally do with editing your images and as a result what you also get is a special guest on today which is actually me hello um, so I'm going to be sat here in the corner of the screen for most of the time um, it is very hot in my office today so um, that's a bit weird but there we go um, so let's get started um, today we're going to run through a couple of things um, on the phase one and capture one system in particular um, I'm also going to cover um, the relationship that there is with teamwork so teamwork are the guys in London they are effectively my phase one partner in that sense. Um, but the way that phase one works is they work with different partners around the world, uh, different countries and uh, teamwork are the ones that go or are my go to. Um, they're also the guys that unfortunately I've woken up in the middle of the night of the weekend um, with emergencies and they've always been quite good with that. So um, they've asked me to do a session today to explain um, some of the key bits. So the IQ4 is a remarkable um, digital back. So some of the key features that are coming with that and how we can get the best out of them in capture one. Um, so let's have a little look. Um, so we're going to cover those three things today. So first is the sensor. Um, we're going to cover that question um, around um, the, the who needs 151 megapixels um, question. We'll cover that in a second. Um, just as one point of, of note, for those of you that haven't joined us before, just please be aware there's about a 15 second delay or so um, between what I say and what I see on the screen as your comments. This is very interactive, so please join in, um, send us comments and whatever. We can try and cover as many questions as we can during the session, um, and we can put those comments up on the screen. Um, but it is designed to be interactive, but I'm not ignoring you. It just takes a couple seconds for some of the comments to arrive on the screen because of the way the streaming works. Um, so IQ4150, uh, and that question, who needs 151 megapixels? Well, I do. <laughs> Um, that's that's the first thing, and I'm going to cover that in a second. Um, two, it's not just about the megapixels, and hopefully that will make sense in a second. So the IQ4 basically is the digital back. It's the it's the monster behind um, a medium format camera system. So that back is this thing, this little lump. Um, that's effectively our film equivalent, um, and this is where all the power and all the cleverness comes into the Phase One system. On the front of it, you can put a load, load of tech cams, whatever tech cam you want, or you can use Phase One's new field camera, which is the XT, which is this little um, beauty. I'll show you some shots in a minute. Um, or you can choose their more well-known, the XF, um, which is this one, which is the uh, the all-rounder, as it were, um, in camera terms. They're pretty big cameras, as you can see. Um, they're, they're not exactly the lightest ultra portable camera in the world, but they are designed to do certain things really, really well. And we're going to cover that today. So the IQ4 system came out uh, from memory. Oh, crikey, when was that? Uh, it's over a year ago now, um, a little while back. Um, I think 2000, ooh, 2018, end of 2018, 19. Um, it's 151 million pixels on the back. So we talk about digital cameras going from sort of 24, 36, 50, 100, and so on. Um, phase one moved the benchmark again um, with the IQ4 up to 151 million pixels. Those pixels aren't just pixels they're big pixels and that's the difference so and the reason that we put this um, image up on the screen we're not just talking about the pixel count we're talking about the pixel size and that means the bigger the pixel the more light it can get in um, so the more dynamic range we've got and we're talking about a camera here with 15 stops of dynamic range to start with um, beyond that we've got a load of stuff um, built into there and we're going to cover that today in the labs feature especially around things like dual exposure plus and frame averaging and those are two um, tools which are unique to phase one um, we'll show you how that all works in a second. Um, so yeah, a couple of people. So uh, June's just said I use the Mamiya RB67 um, and the Senior Bron with it. Yeah, so the, the whole point of these systems is that you can use whatever front you want onto that digital back, um, as long as it's got the adapter and the, the plate to go with it. So that's the sensor, and we're going to cover that in a second. Then we've got the extra, or the extra feature, which is the Phase One Lab. So I'm unfamiliar with another camera brand that does this, um, which is quite often you'll see firmware updates that say, hey, we've got a brand new feature. Bang, here you go. Um, quite often it's not tested fully. You see a version two of that feature and so on. Um, but also 
it means that the developers have sort of gone away into a little dark room, scurried away, come up with some thoughts and ideas, and then delivered a tool that they believe that people will want to use. Phase one, do it differently. So in the back of your digital back, you can load on um, functions and features, which are part of what they call the phase one lab. So frame averaging has now become a more productionized um, application within the camera, and we'll show you that in a second. Dual exposure is still very much in the lab, but both of them came out of the phase one lab. And what that means is they're inviting customers to play with technology, frankly, before it's ready. Um, we're, we're still learning stuff. We're still playing with it. We're still trying to work out how it can be used, how it can be refined. And that's why that lab exists and it exists on every single phase one camera. So you can enable it and you can get previews of technology, which you may not be able to do with other um, other systems. OK, so let's uh, let's crack on. And before we go into frame averaging and dual exposure, we're going to cover that 151 megapixel thing with the who needs 151 million pixels. So this is one of the shots that we did for the launch um, in of the IQ4. It was in 2018. Um, should know because I was stood in the banks of Copenhagen doing some of the test shots for it. Um, so this shot here of the Opera House uh, in Copenhagen, as a big print, it looks great. But what you don't see in this shot is from this distance is down here, there are two guys sat on a computer on a table. Now, with 151 million pixels, I can see what's on their screen. Now, that in theory is wonderful for things like cropping. So it gives me a load of flexibility. I can, I can still crop a, a tiny part of that picture and it gives me a huge image still. But it's also for me, one of the reasons why I switched to phase one. And it's actually one of the reasons why we're gonna go into capture one now. So. Here's the question, why do, we need to, why do we need images that are that big? Here is uh, the entrance to a restaurant on one of the, uh, um, there are I think three of, the, 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 no, three of them at the time, uh, they're sister ships. So these are the largest cruise ships in the world that were launched. Um, and those are some of our images. So these are images which are printed at between 10 and 15 meters wide in actual print size. Um, the way that they're done as lenticular images actually means that for every one meter that you print, you need something like 1.6 meters of, um, of actual image to be able to do it because of the angle it sits at. So these are big prints. Well, of course, we're used to big prints. We used to big prints in billboards and all that sort of stuff. Um, so why is it any, any different? Well, here's the difference. With a billboard, we're talking about a print that you're going to view from, I don't know, 100 meters, half a mile away. Um, so DPI actually is really low on a billboard. And we all know that it's, you know, it can go down to as low as four or five DPI. But it can't when you're sat three feet away from the image. If I'm sat three feet away from the image, the DPI has to be really high. It has to be viewable from that distance and sharp. We've all done it. You know, when you, you, you um, some airports and whatever, they have these amazing pictures of the, the city that you've arrived in. But when you get up close on the escalator, it's blurry, it's, it's pixelated, it's, it's, it's pretty naff, really. Um, and this is the request that we get from quite a lot of our clients around, we want high resolution images. And we want those images to be able to be seen up close. Now, to me as a photographer, um, over the years, it's moved away from being just about the resolution. It's become more about the dynamic range, the features that I get out of this camera, um, the fact that actually I can pull up details in shadows and highlights and stuff that you couldn't do on other systems. But my primary reason for getting into phase one in the first place was purely around resolution and it's done me proud. So from my perspective, we have clients that we wouldn't have had um, if I hadn't been able to produce one single shot that was big and high resolution. So what does that look like um, in terms of high resolution? So these are obviously low res um, JPEGs that are sort of snapshots around uh, of, that, uh, of that place. Here's Chicago, um, taken from a rooftop. Uh, it's taken on the 28 millimeter lens. Um, so on a phase one, on a medium format system, it's a 0.6-ish crop factor. Um, so that's about a 17 millimeter equivalent on, um, on 35 mil. So there's, there's the shot, it looks pretty cool. It's a normal cityscape. But let's have a look at what these guys are doing in their apartment. Now, this is where it gets a bit scary. So as one hint, um, whenever you're staying in a hotel, close the curtains at night. Um, but from a demonstration point of view, this is an ultra wide shot. But the detail levels that I can get into across this picture, I mean, not only is it it's pretty impressive. So when I look at this up close, I can look down into every single car in the parking lot. I can look at the diners and the restaurant and so on. But more importantly, I can make some extra creative decisions around cropping later on and still end up with a high res image. So in terms of what that provides me, it gives me a, a huge amount of flexibility. It also gives me dynamic range that I can recover. So for example, over here, 
in the original shot, this looked particularly blown out. If I'd taken the shot with a, with a standard um, DSLR, the highlights in this would have really need some work um, to correct them. The phase one camera in that IQ um, digital back just literally um, pulls it straight back out of the highlights and we've got all the detail that we want over there. Um, so all of those things sort of add to the fact that it gives me a better quality of image and it gives me an image that I can rely on. And that's what we're, we're going for here. So what does the difference look like? Let's 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 load that up um, just to show you. So here is, luckily enough, a position in uh, Shanghai. I used to shoot this um, location quite a few times. Um, this is taken on a Canon, I think it was a 5D3 um, at the time, so 22, 24 megapixels, something like that. I love this image. I remember taking it at the time. It was an early image that I did in the city. Um, it was a long time ago. Um, but as a long exposure cityscape image, it really worked. And actually, at the time, I remember sort of zooming in and thinking, oh, cool, look at all these details. This is 100% now you're seeing on the screen. Let's go into 200%. Hmm, 300% we're starting to struggle. 400% we're starting to see some real pixelation. Um, we're losing some detail. So a few years later, a couple of years later, I invested in what was then at the time the IQ280, which was the highest resolution camera that Phase 1 made. Um, and let's switch to that image. Same place, same position. Slightly different crop, um, obviously, because the lens is slightly different. It's not quite the same, um, quite the same field of view. But let's have a look at that same place. So let's go into 100%. A lot more detail in here. Um, so let's have a look at 200% or even 300%. And I've now got a lot more detail compared to the equivalent. Let me just move so we've got the, uh, the same building up. So on our left, we have the same building on our Canon. And on the right, that same building in phase one. So obviously, more megapixels, more detail, all that stuff, great. But then FaZe jumped it again. Um, and then, as I say, they, they released the IQ4 with 150 megapixels. There was 100 in between, which was fantastic. I used to use that one too. But I went to the same place with that 100 megapixel, oh, sorry, 150 megapixel camera. So we went from a Canon at 24 to FaZe at 80. Let's go to FaZe at 150 megapixels. Now, again, this was actually taken on this bad boy, the XT, um, with an ultra wide, so it's a 23 millimeter lens, um, medium format. It's a Rodenstock lens. It is tack sharp. It is a stunning piece of glass. So the angle is slightly different again, but let's go and have a look at our buildings over here. And there we are at 100. Let's go up to 200. Now, this one's got a little bit more distortion in it um, from the lens profile itself. I haven't corrected it for it in here. But let's go back to the 80, the 80 megapixel version from phase one. And of course, the lighting's slightly different, but let's zoom into the equivalent on each and look at the difference between the 80 through to the 150. Now, I'm, I'm talking about pretty obvious things. Is 150 million pixels better than 80 megapixels? Of course. But for the time being, let's go back to the 24, in fact, out of the Canon. And let's just zoom into the same sort of level. OK. So there's our state in the obvious segment done. Um, is 151 megapixels better resolution than a 24 megapixels or an 80 megapixels or even 100 megapixels? Yes. But it's not just about that. It is actually about dynamic range. Because forget the detail. Let's just forget that for a moment. And obviously, the detail is pretty impressive. If I load up all the frame um, sizes together, there's our Canon in the middle. There's our 80 megapixel in the, uh, the center ring. And there on the outside is that 150. Now, in reality, they're all the same roughly field of view, but look at that frame size. I can actually fit several of the, um, of the standard DSLR shots into one, but it's the dynamic range that's the killer here. Because not only have I got a lot more detail in the shadows here, let's look at the equivalent on that Canon into there and we're losing stuff, but let's look at our highlights. So let's take this piece of road here and let's take this piece of road here. And yes, of course, we're getting more detail on those traffic trails simply through the resolution itself. But what we're not doing on that phase one back is we're not blowing out highlights that didn't need to be blown out in the first place. Let me just go into the same sort of position as this. And it's about not losing detail. It's about the fact that with those 15 stops of dynamic range, that phase one back is able to capture everything from the brightest highlight to the darkest shadow. And then once we've got that data in the histogram, we can then play with it and capture one later. So it's about not losing it off the ends first so that we can play with it later. We may choose to, to make those shadows darker. We may choose to make the highlights brighter, but I can't choose to do that if I don't have them captured in the first place. 
And again, in fairness, if we go back to the 80, the 80 gave me just the same sort of feel with that dynamic range as the 150. So this is the 80 on the left, corrected, um, not so much of a lean as the one on the right. Um, and, and we look at the difference in that dynamic range and all that detail in that shot. And it is stunning compared to what we were working with only a couple of years ago. Okay. So that's why I print big. Um, one of the reasons is we've got the, the need for it. Um, let's look at, so we've got cityscapes like this. We can zoom into this road section here. We can see every single strand of detail um, in every single traffic trail individually. But it's not just city stuff, it's landscapes too. Um, so this is the firefalls at Yosemite, um, a, a standard sort of landscape image. Um, we got lucky um, last year, this year, they weren't so lucky out there, unfortunately. Um, but at a certain time of year, the way that the sun falls on the, the rocks, you get this amazing effect of fire sort of falling down the, um, down the, the rock face. But here's what I can do. I can go have a look at every single element of that fire, well, fire slash water, um, every single rock, every single specular highlight, every single reflection. We can even go up here and we can look into this mist up here. So I have the ability not only to see all that detail, but I can recompose some of this stuff later on. If I'm going to chop this into a landscape format of image, I'm not worried about resolution because I've still got enough that I can print big, even more changing that crop. Same applies for, you know, shots like this. I mean, this is sunrise. Um, I can choose to sort of nuance this shot and take different crops out of this without worrying about any loss of resolution um, whatsoever. Uh, so where are we at so far? Uh, the 150 megapixel looks real, real and uh, yeah, it real and more neutral. Absolutely. So um, I know ST in fairness. So I, I think I don't know actually if you've been up this building with me. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Um, but absolutely. So what we're going for is the camera's ability to capture reality. Um, I can show you some behind the scenes shots that show that actually this scene does look more like this than it ever did like this. Um, and it's all about capturing that reality. That then we can choose what we do with artistically later on. So um, we said we'd go into those sort of three things um, around resolution and then the, the features in there. To me, that's resolution um, done. If anyone wants examples of resolution, genuinely reach out to the guys at Teamwork, reach out to the guys at Phase One. They can show you as much of this stuff um, as possible. Um, and then Hugo, so <laughs> wish I could afford one of these bad boys, good stuff. Um, genuinely, um, I know lots of people actually who don't own one of the phase one systems. What they'll do is if they have a specific commercial need or a specific job or a specific project in mind, they'll go and rent one. Um, and there's loads of places that you can do that from. If, from memory, I think including teamwork, but don't quote me on that. I'll need to check with, with Alan a bit. Um, but genuinely, um, there, there is a, a case around it's the right tool for the right job. So for me and what I do for cityscapes and landscapes and printing big and printing stuff that's impactful and, and bold, this stuff, I couldn't do my, what I do without a phase one system. However, um, if I was shooting a rapid fire concert series at night, the phase one camera may not be the best tool for that particular job. I might be better off with another tool. So it's around knowing what tool to use for what um, particular application and then working out what you want to do with that. So as I say, a lot of people will use them um, from time to time. They'll, they'll borrow one for a particular project or whatever um, when they need that resolution or when they need that dynamic range um, for something that they know. Okay, so that's resolution. Um, if anyone's got any questions on resolution, pop them in the comments and we'll, we'll pick it up. But that's why I use that phase one system. Um, frankly, it's resolution and dynamic range. But then we move on to the fun stuff, which is the labs. So let's look at um, this particular image. So this was shot in New Zealand. Um, so New Zealand uh, is one of my favorite places to, to visit on the planet. Um, and uh, at the moment, it's a little bit out of bounds, but we'll hopefully get back there soon. Both of these shots, so where you see this line, the shot on the right is shot at 125th of a second. The shot on the left is shot at 125th of a second. And it was shot at exactly the same time in the morning. So how is that possible? And it's possible using something called frame averaging. So we're going to go into a little bit of theory. Sorry about that. Um, let's start off with exposure triangle. So hopefully everyone's familiar with this. It's the boring exposure triangle that everyone's had to learn um, at some point or other as they were trying to do uh, particularly with long exposures and gets the, uh, the exposure balance in your camera. So we go from ISO across to aperture and then across to shutter. Now, 
as it stands at the moment with traditional cameras, the exposure triangle is there to effectively equalize those three components to get the perfect exposure. But a byproduct of that is that in order to equalize, sometimes we have to actually end up changing the amount of time that we're capturing on the on the uh, on the center on the film. So, for example, if I was in a um, an area where I wanted a huge depth of field, and I wouldn't recommend this, but let's say we wanted to move it to f32, and I've got my ISO at 50, and it's pretty dark outside. All of a sudden, a thirtieth of a second isn't going to cut it. So I'd have to move it down to maybe one second, maybe two seconds and so on. So not only then am I balancing my exposure triangle, I'm also increasing the time that the shutter is open and capturing data. As I increase time, I capture more motion, more blur. So that's one thing that quite often as, as landscape photographers, we want to do. We want to catch long exposures. That's why they're called long exposures. It's an exposure for a long time. So we'll use things like filters and so on. And what the filter does is it cuts the light coming in, obviously. And that means that for the same aperture and the same ISO, we can have a longer exposure time. But that comes with lots of problems. So all the standard filter problems, so vignetting and color cast and all that sort of stuff. But also we have things like, and I remember I've done sort of three minute exposures and the boats come across the horizon and stuff like that. And your shot is completely ruined as a result of that. And the reason it's ruined is because if I don't complete my calculated exposure time, I've actually then lost the correct exposure for that scene. So what the phase one guys done or did is very clever. They've separated time from exposure through something called frame averaging. So instead of having to worry about my exposure affecting time, I can now worry about time and exposure independently. I can set my exposure for the correct exposure for that scene. And then separately, I can choose how long I want to capture the motion for. And the way that it does that is effectively it takes every single individual frame and every individual pixel, puts it into a bucket at the, in the middle, and then works out the average of all of those um, recordings and then gives you one raw file at the end. So this isn't the camera system giving you, um, I don't know, 200 raw files um, for you to then blend later on. The camera gives you one pure, clean raw file that's the correct output for that exposure over the period of time that you've decided you want to capture that exposure for. A couple of other benefits. So this is that interchange that you've seen um, just now on the, the sample picture. Um, I don't have to dangle a load of glass filters over the edge of a building. That's, that's a pretty big benefit for a start. Um, secondly, and more importantly for me, I can decide how long I want that exposure to be, not controlled by what filters I've got in my bag, but whatever I choose. So if I choose I want a one and a half minute exposure, but I don't have the right ND to push that up to one and a half minutes, it doesn't matter. As long as I get the exposure in a single frame correct, then I'm able to actually have the whatever, whatever length of time or whatever movement and motion and whatever in that in that uh, shot according to what I want rather than according to what the equipment that I have in my bag. So from that perspective, this gives me ultimate flexibility extra one as a little added benefit i can stop recording at any point in time so that cruise ship scenario so i'm sat there taking a picture of the opera house wonderful i see a cruise ship coming i've only done two minutes of a 10 minute exposure fine i'll just stop recording i stop the time i don't have to stop worry with worrying about the exposure being underdone or anything like that and having to recover shadows because my exposure was correct whether i did one frame 10 frames 100 frames or a thousand frames the time is separate now from exposure, and that's what frame averaging gives us. So let's have a look at um, that, that shot that I showed you earlier in, in Capture One. Um, funnily enough, we actually use it as a reference shot for, uh, for frame averaging. Um, it was actually shot on the XT camera as well. So there are a couple of benefits that come with um, frame averaging, and there's some things to be aware of. Um, so first off, these three images are shot from exactly the same position on exactly the same roof. The one on the left, um, obviously ISO 200 for three seconds, but it was frame averaged, which meant I had a three second exposure taken again and again and again and again for 80 seconds and then averaged in the camera. The camera is a pretty powerful computer nowadays in there. Um, and it gives me one raw file of all of those things combined. Middle shot, we've got an ISO 800 shot. We had to um, for a quarter of a second at 80 second frame average as well. And you'll see why in a second we did that difference. 
And then we've got the shot, which is just a single normal exposure. So again, ISO 800, quarter of a second the same, but a single exposure. So instead of averaging all of those frames out, we get the detail. So let's have a look at those top bits. Because here's one of the other benefits of frame averaging. And this is something that, that quite often we just refer to frame averaging as, oh, it makes long exposures easy. It also gets rid of noise. So if you think about what frame averaging is actually doing, it is looking at every single pixel and it's taking the average of all of the frames that it collected to produce one raw file. Well, of course, noise is average. Oh, sorry, is average, it's random. Um, if I average out something that's randomized, I get something that's a much cleaner result. So those two shots that you're seeing on the screen, the one on the left, ISO 800, it's a quarter of a second, it's a single shot, single exposure. This is traditionally the way that we would have done a quarter of a second exposure. Now, of course, I could do it for longer with a long exposure with a filter, but introducing the filter, I've got the risk of color cast. I'm putting something in front of the lens. I've got the risk of more spots on the, the filter. I've got the risk of vignetting in that shot. And on top of all of that, the filter itself, unless it's completely factory level clean, it can also introduce some stuff on the frame that we really don't want. Plus, I don't really want, actually, from a personal point of view, I'm, my days of hanging over the edge of a building with loads of pieces of glass and hoping that they don't fall. And yes, we take precautions, but in reality, it is a risk. My, those days are gone for me. I'd rather, I'd rather go the safer route. Let's switch to frame averaging. So on the frame averaging shot on the right, it's still an ISO 800 shot. It's still a quarter of a second. It's still from the same scene. But it did a quarter of a second exposures again and again and again over 80 seconds. And it then brings that back inside, computes it, and works out the average of every single pixel in that shot. If we think about the way that those storage buckets are working, it also means that to push the highlights to be clipped is really difficult, and to push the lowlights to be underexposed is really difficult because of the nature of the fact that it's averaging out those pixels. So what I actually end up doing as a result of all of this is extending my dynamic range as well. So frame averaging actually can give us a little bit extra frame or a little bit extra dynamic range, a little bit extra highlight protection, a little bit extra shadow protection. And that little bit extra really, really, really helps. Trust me, it, it really does. Now, what it doesn't do, and this is one thing that we've got to be very clear on here, what frame averaging doesn't do is balance the scene. Yes, it will give you a slightly larger dynamic range. So the phase one camera starts at 15 stops already. That's pretty good. Um, it gives you probably an extra stop, maybe a little bit more, depending on the scene. Um, so you get a little bit more dynamic range, which will help you with highlight and shadow protection. But what it doesn't do is balance the scene. So if I've got a brilliantly bright sky and a very, very dark shadow in the bottom, what frame averaging is not going to give me is that graduated filter effect of being able to darken the sky and lighten the, well, not lighten, but not darken the, the base and the, the shadow area and give an even exposure. So it will help, but it's not going to do that full three stop, four stop exposure. And as a hint, that's why you're here to learn about dual, average, or dual exposure as well. Um, but frame averaging itself is effectively the equivalent as a long exposure photographer as having a solid ND filter on the front with a bit of dynamic range boost. But one of the things that you are gonna see if you start playing with frame averaging is the nuance between what's called continuous and gap. And one of the things that I've heard people um, talk about, in fact, uh, we did a webinar, um, Owl is actually online at the moment, I've just seen, um, he's uh, just put a comment up saying it has to be seen to be believed. Um, so, um, we did a session last week with Joe Cornish and I with uh, Lau at Phase One and Al um, at Teamwork. And one of the things that Joe actually pointed out is um, y the frame averaging effect can look less organic. Um, and I, I believe the same. Um, it, it looks less organic necessarily than a true long exposure with a filter. One of the reasons for that is this difference between something called continuous and gap. So in terms of this shot, um, I showed you uh, let me just pull up in a second this uh, example here so obviously in the top we just covered that with the noise in the top of that um, the top of that skyscraper area however let's look at this uh, detailed part of the road intersection let's have a look up close so these are both frame average shots but you'll see the one on the left looks a lot smoother than the one on the right they're both 80 seconds they're both at I well one was I said 200 ones at 800 I'll explain why in a second but they're both frame average shots. So why is the one on the right got the little dash marks uh, looking pretty digital, if anything, and the one on the left looking more smooth? And the reason is because 
it's about how quickly that digital back can record images. So we got in here XQD cards and, and ridiculously high speed SD cards, but still each raw is 150 to 200 meg. If I'm doing rapid fire exposures, so less than half a second for each frame, the amount of data that camera's got to shift goes into terabytes. So you've got to be really, really careful and really, really aware if you're shooting things that have a long flow. So things like city traffic trails, like in this example, or clouds or water moving or something like that. If the shutter speed for an individual frame when you're doing frame averaging falls below half a second, you get something called gaps. And the gaps are what you see in this image on the right. And the gap is actually the time in between those two frames to be added into the average stack. So in this case, on the left, three seconds, basically, by the time it's recorded that one, it's ready to record the next one and the processor's dealing with it in the background. Within three seconds, it's got time to catch up. In fact, within half a second, it's got time to catch up. We did the image on the right intentionally to show what happens when you choose gap on the camera. The camera will automatically flip between continuous and gap and it will tell you it's going into gap mode the second that your shutter speed goes below faster than half a second. When you do, the risk that you have is you can introduce something that looks less organic than a traditional long exposure. So what you may find is either shifting your ISO to a lower ISO, and the example here is a perfect one. In order to get it to a quarter of a second, we actually had to push it to ISO 800. Shooting at ISO 800, as we've just shown you, on a frame averaged image is no problem on, uh, on phase one. It's pretty much noise free as a result of frame averaging happening. But if you get that shutter speed fast enough, faster than half a second, you may introduce some non-organic artifacts that you weren't expecting um, throughout that image. Okay, um, so where are we? David's just asked, so how do you best determine how long to frame average for a specific set of settings? Well, this is the beauty, uh, good question, and it's, it's the beauty of frame averaging. So here's that whole, let's go back to this one, um, the, the old uh, the lesson with Paul time. Um, here's, the, here's the cool bit. With my exposure separated from time, I can choose the two completely independently. So for example, as long as my exposure is within the, the bracket of continuous shooting, which is what I would try and aim for, um, typically for a long exposure, then how long I capture is based in my head around how much motion I'm trying to capture in the image. It's nothing to do with exposure anymore. So I set my exposure to whatever I want it to be, get it correctly exposed for what I'm looking for, but then time, is completely separate. So if I've got fast moving clouds and rapidly moving water, I may only need 20 seconds, 30 seconds worth of frame average. If I've got slow moving clouds, well, A, I might choose not to do any, but B, if I want to do an hour's worth, then fine. I just dial it in for an hour and just watch the thing go. The digital map will tell you how many frames it's gonna um, record to create that average. But effectively, your time is now completely independent of what you wanna record. Um, and to me, this is another thing as well, the fact that you can save at any point, what I've started doing, um, whether it's right or wrong, I have started setting my frame average to much longer than I want. And the reason is because I know I can stop at any point. So I can, let's dial it in for 10 minutes. I can then say, actually, after three minutes and 37 seconds, that's enough movement. And I see a kayaker coming along and that's gonna ruin the water and the silky look of that. So let's just stop now. And the difference is with frame averaging, at whatever point I stop, it makes no difference. My exposure is still correct. That's the difference with this stuff. So with a traditional way of doing long exposures, my exposure is tied to time. If I cut my exposure short, because I've had to cut my time short, I end up with an, un or an underexposed image. Okay, um, so uh, another good question. ST's on, on form today. So uh, what's the impact if you put an ND filter to allow longer exposure to keep continuous light trail? Exactly what you should do. Good answer, <laughs> good answer in your question. Um, so exactly that. Um, if I'm sat at a place where I have dialed in um, the settings that I need and it's coming into, let's say, I don't know, uh, 30th of a second, I'm gonna add, if, if those are the settings that I want, of course I could try and reduce my ISO, I could try and reduce um, my, my aperture, but I don't really wanna get into the place of sort of F22s and all that sort of stuff. I may choose to add a single ND filter, maybe a three stop or a four stop filter on the front of the lens, but not a square one. So all the risk of light leaks and all that sort of stuff go away. A proper screw in, um, you know, old school screw it in the front of the lens, ND filter to bring that range back inside half a second. 
if I'm not trying to capture organic stuff, and more importantly, if I'm trying to, for instance, make crowds disappear, then gap versus continuous becomes irrelevant. But this is about where we're trying to capture smooth motion of things that are moving in front of the camera. If we want continuous motion and we want it to look organic, then add a filter on if necessary, bring it into that half a second point, and you've got a perfect long exposure with hardly any noise and an extended dynamic range. So that's pretty cool. So let's have a little look at some frame averaging stuff. So some of you, when you saw um, the launch of, uh, we did a long exposure guide with phase one. You should go and have a look, go to phase one site. Um, it's on the learning hub. Um, you can download long exposure. There's lots of videos of me talking about filters and um, graduated filters and polarizers and stuff like that. And we shot it up in Scotland. And this was actually before it was even in labs. This was way, way, way before um, and we were playing with frame averaging. So here is a traditional long exposure shot. Um, this is with a filter in front. Um, if I'm completely honest, it's not as sharp as I wanted it to be um, because we had a lot of movement in this particular shot. It was very, very windy. Go figure for Scotland. Um, but at 150 mil, it's, uh, it's a pretty decent amount of detail in there. We've got the clouds looking pretty um, angry up there. This is a traditional long exposure shot. And then here is the same long exposure shot but without a graduated filter, which is also quite interesting because of that dynamic range pop, I've had the ability to pull in some dynamic range um, out of the highlights and without any form of ND filter. So this is a 40th of a second. So when we're talking about continuous versus gap, if your exposure, oh, sorry, if your um, frame average is over a long enough period, actually those continuous versus gap issues start to go away. On traffic trails particularly, it can be a bit more annoying. You need, you need really to make sure it's continuous when you're doing traffic trails. But for water movement, where it's going to go over the same spot again and again and again, or with cloud movement, where typically you're going to have something else chasing that same cloud, you don't have to worry quite so much about continuous versus gap. But this shot, bear in mind, was taken without any filter. So it was a 40th of a second, but it was captured for, from memory, something like five minutes. No filter, in daylight, no GND, no ND, no nothing. And we've got on there effectively a perfect sharp image with a natural looking flag flapping around and so on with all the details i'd expect all the smoothness in the water that i'd expect and all this smoothness up here in the sky without any filter it's a long exposure but it's a single exposure of 40 or uh, 1 40th of a second averaged out over a long period of time okay uh let's have another look so again if I look at my EXIF data, a 30th of a second. Well, clearly it wasn't a 30th of a second. And again, we've still got that organic looking clouds up here. They're still moving around enough where I'm not seeing any lines. I'm not seeing any um, stuff that's sort of giving me jitters or, or, or uh, that Morse code effect. So don't worry too much about continuous versus gap, but just bear in mind, there are some scenarios where if you haven't captured enough frames, um, or you're shooting something that's only in one position once and it's having a big impact to the, um, the lighting in that particular place, then you're going to see maybe some gaps um, in your average. But overall, um, as long as you're shooting for a long enough frame average with single um, frames that are the right, um, the right shot for that exposure, you're going to get some really nice organic effects. Um, and again, so this is one of the shots that was actually in the brochure um, for the XT. Um, this is a no filter frame averaged image. It's 125th of a second. We can see that on the bottom here at f11. Um, and from my point of view, here's the other little winner in this. Here's a long exposure shot, um, and a traditional long exposure shot, 30 seconds with a filter. This is the frame average shot. It was obviously at a slightly different time of day. But I just want to have a look out at this lighthouse. They're in slightly different positions out here. To my eye, that frame average shot looks so much crisper than the non-frame average shot. And one of the reasons for that is around its noise control. Because we've got rid of all of that random noise that happens over a long exposure, especially things like the, with the sensor heating up and whatever, or the heat noise that happens, but also all of the shadow noise that happens. Because we get rid of that, because we average it all out, everything just becomes more crisp and clean. And we're going to cover some of that in a second as well when we go into dual exposure. But these are the reasons why when I start to look at that camera in terms of what it can produce as an output versus just the resolution, it's all of this stuff that becomes really important, not just the fact that it's 151 million pixels. 
151 million pixels is cool. Don't get me wrong. The fact that I can look at this shot out here and then go in that close into that lighthouse is phenomenal. But the, the, the megapixel race will be ongoing. There will always be more. Then, you know, coming around the corner, there will be higher and higher and higher sensors. Phase one, I'm pretty sure, will be on the, on the forefront with that stuff. But it's not just about how many pixels I've got. It's about how good those pixels are at recording light and how well the camera can process what it's getting. So on that note, let's talk about the latest development. Um, and this is the fun one. And this is the one that came out very, very recently. Um, this is called Dual Exposure Plus. So not to be confused, and I, I keep using the wrong words, um, and it's because of something else I did many years ago uh, of Dual Pixel. It's not, this is Dual Exposure Plus. Again, it's one of the lab's features. So again, going into this whole phase one lab approach, frame averaging went through the lab, um, it had a lot of feedback with users. It had a lot of stuff that was going on about um, how um, to use it best, how to get the best out of it, um, how to uh, maybe look at some different use cases for it and, and how people were actually using it and then refine it, refine it, refine it, and then get it ready for production. Dual Exposure Plus is in the lab right now. So it is still being refined. It's still being worked on. The developers are still coming up with new ways that it can be used. They're still getting loads of customer feedback before it becomes a production piece of software or tool on the camera. But if you own a phase one camera, you can turn this on. You literally go into, let me just load it up. Uh, you go into the settings on your um, digital back. You go into lab features and turn them on. Um, then as you swipe in from the right hand side, you'll see extra features. And one of them is this little logo for dual exposure. So dual exposure, um, put very simply, is effectively um, the way that the camera can take two very rapid exposures, pretty much they feel like they're at the same time, three stops apart, and effectively average them in the camera, if you think about it in those terms. It's not quite averaging, it does it slightly differently, and I'm not going to go into the technical stuff that I couldn't claim I know um, inside out. But just in the same way as frame averaging, it's automated. With dual exposure, I dial in my base exposure for my highlights. So I expose to get my highlights correct. Then the camera is going to um, automatically calculate a three stop difference. And at the exact same time that it, take, it starts that process of taking the base exposure, it will also start the process of taking the shadow exposure, which is three stops different. Now, why three stops? Let's think about this. Typically, when we're doing something like a um, landscape scene or something like that, one of the most useful um, filters out there is a three stop GND, right? Um, whether it's soft or hard or whatever, most people will stick around three stops, sometimes four. It's very extreme. You've got to be to sort of five or six stops. So a three stop filter is kind of that winning um, um, combination between balancing highlights and shadows. But that's only good to me if the highlights and shadows with a GND filter are in one particular place. So if you've got highlights at the top and shadows at the bottom or vice versa or whatever, because obviously you can turn it. But if I've got a lump of highlights and a lump of shadows, that's great. What happens if I've got a lump of highlights and a lump of shadows that are mixed up? Well, there's no filter in the world that's going to help me with that. So typically what I'd end up doing is bracketing. And bracketing has some other challenges, which is when you have to blend it together. So what phase one have done is they've come up with a new function, hence dual exposure plus, dual exposure because it takes two exposures. Um, and the plus actually for me is more about the result of it because what it delivers is a camera that goes from 15 stops of dynamic range to a camera that's genuinely delivering for you 18 stops of dynamic range. Your average camera out there is something between 12, 13, maybe some of 14 stops of range, but it's, you've got to really be pushing it um, and up there um, to get to 14 stops. Phase one, obviously, uh, at the highest um, point up there, they're at 15 stops with the standard sensor. With dual exposure plus, that gives you another three stops. Now, remember, a stop isn't just, that's not just three more than 15. For every stop, it's double. So I've doubled, quadrupled, and times the light by eight times in what I can capture in that single frame in terms of its highlight or its shadow in order to create one correctly exposed image. I've got so much more envelope in my histogram that I don't have to worry about underexposing or overexposing. And therefore, I can reduce the number of times I'm looking at bracketing an image. So let's have a look at an example, um, this example here. So we actually tested this out in uh, Miami, down in Collins Avenue. Um, so. Here's a shot 
Um, this is a shot that is exposed for highlights. It's a single shot. It's on the Phase One XF camera um, with dual, ex well, sorry, without dual exposure enabled, but with the function on the camera. So it's underexposed. We all, we'd all agree with that. Let me just turn on to my um, my histogram here. We've got a huge amount of data here in the shadows, but also a little bit of data up here in the highlights. And that data is obviously where these areas up here are exposed up at the 245, 250, 255 level in the histogram. So this is exposed for those highlights. Now, of course, with 15 stops of dynamic range, I can pull up a huge amount of detail. So let me just pull up all the shadows. Let's go to 100. Let's pull up the levels of black, which is basically the lowest part of the histogram here. Um, so maybe the bottom four or five percent as well. And we could also, if we wanted to, use our high dynamic range tool to pull our highlights and our whites down. Um, if we really wanted to, personally, I'll leave them a little bit up there because I, I like the fact that they sort of glow. Um, but yet yeah, we've got some great recovery in there. And let me just zoom in to maybe 200 percent. Um, we're looking pretty good in a single shot. So let's copy those exact settings. So if I look at my dual exposure version, exactly the same exposure as before. It was still 0 0.8 of a second um, at f8, and I'm going to apply those same settings. OK. Let's look at these two side by side. So there's my single shot. There's my dual exposure shot. They look pretty much the same when you look at them side by side, only they're not quite. Because where we've got rid of a lot of that noise in the shadows, when we pull up the shadows, we don't get this sort of murky effect down here and this sort of mishmash, almost a mashed potato effect on here. We've got the texture of the building on here. So we've got less noise, we've got more texture. The images are sharper. So I haven't had to use any form of um, bracketing to pull up all of the same information that I would do normally through an HDR shot. If I go in here, oops, should have done that at the same time with the other one. Um, let's go into 200% on this and let's look here. Our dual exposure shot. So this isn't about necessarily recovering shadows and, and keeping look, or looking after highlights. Our dual exposure shot where there were shadows has got cleaner data, clearer information, more texture, better lines. It's stronger, it's cleaner. It can be printed bigger without worrying about it looking soft. And we can see that here this starts to look soft not because the lens was so it's the same lens from left to right it's exactly the same sensor from left to right it's the same exposure from left to right but the difference is because i haven't had to drag up noise with the shadow i've dragged up the correct exposure for the shadow and it's blended that with the correct exposure for the highlights all of a sudden i've got a crisp image through and through so that's how we work in at night um and with the same let's have a look at uh Another little shot down here. So this is single shot versus uh, dual exposure of a different hotel um, on Collins Avenue. So let's pull up the shadows, pull up the black area. Uh, let's just uh, apply those ex examples over there. OK, so let's have a look maybe at this open window up here. And let's go into 200 percent. So again, single shot on the left, dual exposure shot on the right. The increase in dynamic range is not necessarily about trying to show more and more of the detail in the shadows. It's about when I pull up the detail in the shadow, what quality of image I'm getting, what quality of pixels I'm pulling up and exposing. So on the left hand side, this is uh, it's, it's phenomenal what that phase one camera can do in a single shot. You saw how dark those were to begin with and how much that detail has come up without really that much noise in the first place. But look at how much cleaner and clearer and more crisp the one on the right is as a result. In fact, just to be really cruel, I'm going to go in one more up to 300%. You're looking at an image now which is 300% magnification. It is, of course, going to look pixelated. But what I'm looking at here compared to here is worlds apart. Look at the detail and the texture on this glass compared to in here. And when you're printing at the size that we print and we're expecting customers to see that image at that distance, this stuff is important. This is why it's worth doing. OK, so let's look um, at a completely different scenario. Um, but again, it's dual exposure. So again, dual exposure, I go onto the camera, I go into the lab function and I choose dual exposure. I set my single exposure for my highlights in my image. I then allow the camera to automatically work out what three stops longer is in terms of um, exposure time. And it will do that same shot at the same time and put them together as one raw file.
just as one thing to bear in mind for those of you that are trying this on a phase one system, um, the same thing with frame average as well, actually. So on a dual exposure shot, the reason you know it's a dual exposure shot compared to a single shot is in the EXIF data. If I look at the vendor firmware line up here on the left hand side, you'll see it says IQ4 150 MP um, version 7. So if you want to put this on your camera, make sure you're running version 7 um, on your firmware version. Um, and it's that that's the standard firmware that I expect to see. If I put dual exposure onto the shot, you'll see on here under format, it's going to say IQ4 or IQL 16 bit as normal, but then dual exposure plus. So you still choose your image format in the back of the camera. Whatever you chose here, um, you then see, so see this addition of dual exposure plus. That's telling you that this shot was um, done as a dual exposure. There's actually two blended exposures in that one raw file. Now let's look at a frame average shot. And this is one thing that actually caught me out. Sorry for zooming in then, didn't mean to make you all sick. Um, so just one thing to bear in mind, if I import into Capture One, I used to edit this description field under the metadata, and that's quite normal, uh, lots of people do it. Be aware, if I put in there Shanghai 2020 or Portland Bill Lighthouse 2020, where Capture One stores the fact that a shot was frame averaged is in that description field at the moment. So when I import into Capture One, if I edit my description field in my metadata, it's going to overwrite what my frame average time was. I can always get it back by going back to the original raw, but just bear in mind, unlike with dual exposure where it's embedded up here in the format, frame averaging is embedded in here in the IPTC content area, and that is what the import dialog box will overwrite in a catalog if I edit the description, so be careful. Right. Um, David has just raised a question about the uh, challenges of white balance. So dual exposure plus, in order to use it, you must set your white balance to um, a set or a set number, the correct white balance for the scene at the moment. Again, this is one of the reasons why we talk about it being in labs. So at the moment, if I do an auto white balance, the result is green. I'm not going to lie about it. It looks green. Um, of course, you can correct that in Capture One. You can go into Capture One and alter the white balance of the shot later on. So if it was, let's go particularly down here. It's sort of like that sometimes. Um, of course, I could correct for it. I could use, even use the picker and, and choose it, whatever, and get it back. Or just dial in a fixed white balance. Stick to daylight if you want to as a, as a baseline. But do bear in mind if you're using Dual Exposure Plus, auto or auto white balance won't help you. Okay. So this is a shot, uh, this, is, this is why I look so tired. It was at four o'clock in the morning uh, yesterday and the day before we tried as well. Um, weather wasn't particularly great, but um, later on we'll, we'll show some of the sunrise stuff. Um, so most importantly, we've got a single exposure, dual exposure, uh, a frame average shot without a filter and a shot with a graduated neutral density filter. So where we've got, you can see some vignetting up here on this 23 millimeter lens that we were using, it's very difficult to find a filter that doesn't vignette. Um, and actually, the more I look at it, the less I'm going to need it because let's look at what I can see in the difference between, for example, um, this shot here. In fact, before we even go into the differences in the shadows, let me show you something extra as well, because of course, I could do a long exposure to get rid of some of that noise. I could do some frame averaging to get rid of some of the noise. So especially in the shadows, I might see some noise around here. On a frame average, of course, I'd get rid of all that noise as well. But what I don't get with frame averaging is the clarity up here in this lighthouse top because it's exposing for a long period of time or it's capturing information for a long period of time. This is pretty windy. If I look at the frame average one, you notice how it's not as sharp. And I said before that frame average shots tended to look sharper to me and clearer. That's true as long as we haven't got a lot of wind battering the camera and moving it around during its one minute or two minute exposure. So in this case, dual exposure is going to deliver me a better result for sharpness because it's not doing it for as long, but it's still giving me that dynamic range bump and getting rid of all the noise in the shadows that frame averaging would, but over a shorter uh, period of time. So let's have a look at this shot. So what happened basically is the sun started coming out. Woo, great. And of course here, without much sun in the shot, I can expose pretty averagely for everything. Um, and I'm not going to lose too much in the shadows, too much in the highlights. The second the sun comes out, everything's different. And we all know that. Um, so the second that we get this massive deviation between the highlights and the shadows, um, we've got to do something. So typically what we do, as again, we're all pretty aware, we might want to put a filter over the top of it. So let's look at without a filter and with a filter. 
Well, actually, two things have happened here. One, I've darkened the top of the image, not the area of the sun that I really wanted to darken, and that's because of the gradient. So that doesn't really help me here. But number two, if I look at the lighthouse in particular, so let's look here, because the filter starts off dark and gets lighter, when using a GND, it's not just the sky that I'm darkening, I'm also darkening my subject. So I'm losing data in my subject as a result of using a graduated filter. So what would happen if I use the dual exposure? Well, I protect my highlights and I protect my shadows, and I haven't had to use a gradient filter that's going to also affect my subject. So let's have a little, uh, let's have a little peek. Let's have a look at uh, in here. So we have a shot. Nothing has changed on this shot. You can see on here in high dynamic range, we haven't pulled anything up, but I could. I could pull up our shadows. I could pull up the black areas. I could pull down our highlights, pull down our whites a little bit. Okay, cool. And when I do that in a single exposure, and I'm going to be very cruel, I'm going to pull it all the way up here. Again, we're talking about a camera with 15 stops of dynamic range out of the box. That's great. Let's apply this to a single image and let's look at these two side by side. So again, look at the detail that we're losing and the texture that we're losing between a single shot here and all of these lines down here, all this brickwork and so on, that's clearer, it's more defined, it's less noisy than what I have in the traditional single shot exposure. So I'm getting cleaner information back onto the shot and obviously don't do this level of HDR tuning, it starts to look cartoony. But what you're going to see in here is the difference between the noise that sits in the shadows from a single exposure versus the cleanliness of, of those shadows in the dual exposure. As one tip for people, instead of doing this all through high dynamic range, because of course you get this, this cartoon look, do it through curves. Um, so let's have a look at our dual exposure here. Instead of doing this pull up of shadows and pull up of blacks and pull down of highlights and pull down of whites, which ends up with halos and all this flattening in the image. Instead, look at your curves. And what you can do is I can protect my highlights here. I can pull up my shadows evenly. In fact, I can do it just in the very darkest parts here. And in fact, I can then pull my highlights down if I wanted to. So I get the same effect of pulling up shadow detail and pushing down some of the overexposed areas without that haloing and that fake look that happens with it. I can, of course, then bring in a little bit of contrast and saturation overall. We can play with white balance and so on, but curves are gonna give you a better output than purely relying on HDR. So let's look at uh, the, where are we? The cottage look. Um, there's the dual exposure here. Let's go back in and look at our dual exposure versus single exposure. And let's look at the roof of that cottage. Should have done that at the same time as well. Um, okay. So let's go into 200%. Let's in fact go into 300%. So let's look at the difference. The one on the left, which is a single exposure on a 15 stop dynamic range camera, which is stunning. The one on the right is the dual exposure. Out far, they look exactly the same. Let's just uh, have a look there. It's the same shot, it's the same exposure. They were both F8, 250th of a second, both are ISO 50. But the difference is with the dual exposure, I've got the ability to protect all of this detail in the shadow down here while also protecting the highlights. So if I expose for the highlights, I'm losing the shadows. In a single shot, in order to not lose the shadows, I'd have to overexpose the highlights. In this scenario, I haven't lost either, just come out into here and let's have a look over at our sunshine on both. Yes, of course, it's overexposed. Um, we weren't playing in with any particular careful um, approach here, but I haven't overexposed at all compared to the single shot. But my shadows between the two of them are in a different league if I compare this roof here and these tiles from the single shot across the dual exposure. Of course, again, same scenario. I could do this with frame averaging, but then frame averaging, I'm gonna get a long exposure. I'm also gonna get some movement in the camera um, if it's particularly windy. I could do it with a soft GND, but I'm gonna get vignetting, I'm gonna get all the downsides of a filter, and I'm gonna darken the top of the lighthouse, which is the subject that I'm trying to capture in the first place. So a GND is not always your friend. I could do it with bracketing. So I could take a dark bracket, a middle bracket, a middle exposure bracket, and a light bracket for the shadows. But a couple of things will happen with that. Number one, if anything has moved, like, I don't know, in this case, grass, trying to blend those two shots together is going to be a nightmare. Two, the actual blending of it, well, I've got to make a load of decisions, and it's a load of work later on to work out what to do it. And some of these automated tools that are now promoting how wonderful auto HDR is, honestly, 
I wouldn't touch them. I've played with them. They're, they're not what they promote. You are better off getting it right as much as we say in camera as possible. Dual Exposure Plus gives you the ability to try and get more of that data that you, than you could possibly do before in the camera in a single RAW file. Remember, it's not generating bracketed shots or anything like that. It's generating a single RAW file that you can still play with. Okay, um, so we've run through today. Um, that was the point of today. Um, the IQ4 one, 150 um, was 151 megapixels. Why do we um, use that sensor? Because it's got a huge dynamic range. It produces amazing clean shots that are massive for me to either print as they are or crop um, to whatever, whatever I choose. Um, we've got frame averaging in there, um, which is one of the lab's products. And frame averaging gives me an amazing ability like this one to create long exposure effects but without the need for all those heavy ND filters and so on. And it's also getting rid of any noise in the shot um, by averaging out the noise across all of those different frames. Um, and it, it completely separates the idea of time from exposure, which to me opens up a whole new level of creativity. Then we've got dual exposure plus. So in those times where we don't want a long exposure, where we just want to pull up the detail in the shadow without losing texture, without losing sharpness, and without having to worry about bracketing or doing any of the, um, the blending and so on that, that's done um, in Photoshop and, and whatever else. Um, we can just do it out of camera with a single button um, with a dual exposure plus. And Capture One is designed, of course, so that when we pull this in, it's going to pull up all that detail that I want um, with a single click. Okay, um, so that's us pretty much for today. Um, for those people that have questions and so on, um, that's effectively where we're going to end uh, today's session. By all means, please um, have that conversation, um, continue that conversation. So we've got um, on here, I'll show you some contacts in a minute, but also bear in mind, we've got that Facebook group that a lot of you are already in. Um, so please join that. Um, that gives us the ability to play with some of this stuff sort of offline behind the scenes and, and answer questions and so on ongoing. Um, for those of you that are wondering about using Capture One, take a look over there on our YouTube channel, which lots of you are on at the moment. Um, you'll see on there pro tips and all that sort of stuff. Um, all of that stuff is free. Um, go get it and you'll learn how to do you know, exposure um, correction and before and after tools and clarity and dust spot finding and all that sort of stuff. For those of you that want to talk to the guys at Phase One or Teamwork, Phase One is obviously phase1.com. Um, genuinely, hit a, talk to Teamwork. Get a, get a play with one of these. Um, you know, they, if you want to have a chat with them and say, oh, I'm not sure about um, one of these Phase One cameras. I want to play with one for a while. They'll help you do that. Um, so give the guys a shout. Um, Al's been on here for a little while um, already watching some of the comments, but give them a, or drop them a line. Um, have a chat with them. They, they are great guys. Um, I work with them quite a lot um, and they will help wherever they can. But more importantly, you, a lot of this stuff is great on screen, but you really can't see some of the quality of the, um, the output from these cameras until you've played with it yourself in your environment with what you shoot. So genuinely have a, have a little uh, chat with those guys. Um, and I'm going to leave you in the meantime with uh, make sure that you keep up with all the editing sessions that we're doing and all that stuff. Um, and that's how you get hold of me. And that's it. So I've disappeared off your screen. That's good. Your screen now looks much more um, happy and, and pretty without me. Um, and I will catch you guys next week for live editing of your images rather than mine. But in the meantime, um, we'll see you later. Cheers. Bye.